what's going on here. Okay. We see your slides perfectly, Michael. Excellent. So I guess we are ready to start. Welcome to all of you. I am Andrea Bonomi Savignon from the University of Rome Tor Vergata. As you can read from my background, I'm the SIG Chair for uh, Public and Nonprofit Management. I'm especially glad and proud today to introduce our panelists, and especially Professor Michael Basley. Professor Basley is uh, a professor at the London School of Economics, the Department of Management, where he also served as the head of the department. But most of all, I would say, uh, Michael is one of the intellectual leaders within the public management discipline, and he has worked uh, uh, in close contact with uh, the boundaries between public and uh, private management. And uh, I also have very fond memories of Michael being a mentor for me in one of my very first uh, international conferences, I think 10 years ago. So I'm, uh, I'm especially glad to have uh, him as a host today for this symposium. I also want to thank uh, SIG's Innovation and Strategic Management uh, with whom this symposium is uh, co-sponsored and uh, co-promoted. So we have uh, uh, Javier Castaner from the University of Lausanne, who is uh, uh, from the Strategic Management uh, SIG. Uh, hello, Javier. He will serve as a discussant uh, for the ideas uh, that will be presented today in this symposium, along with, along with myself and along with uh, Pascal Masson from the Innovation SIG, who will join us uh, in, in, in some minutes. Uh, so we have very, very short introduction uh, about uh, uh, Michael and especially about the ideas that will be presented. Uh, I think Michael has been uh, at the forefront of uh, strategic management in public uh, organizations of the last uh, two decades. And especially uh, during these uh, uh, last 20 years, uh, uh, he has been uh, specifically interested in working on research about uh, professional knowledge and professional practice, uh, both within public management, but uh, mostly interesting about what public management can learn from private management and the other way around, right? So lesson learned uh, from public management uh, to the wider context uh, of, uh, of the private sector. Uh, and so this is the uh, I think the, the pivot idea, the key idea behind uh, <clears throat> his, latest, uh, his latest book that will be the center of this presentation and uh, uh, that we're going to be able to discuss uh, after uh, his presentation. So first we will have uh, some uh, ideas uh, and some feedback from uh, us, from the panelists, and then we will open the floor in the last uh, 20 minutes, 25 minutes for uh, a Q and A with the audience. So I invite you to both use uh, uh, the chat uh, in the top right corner of your uh, Zoom screen, or uh, just prepare some uh, questions or feedback uh, uh, for uh, for the end of the event. So thanks again very much, uh, uh, Michael, for being with us, and uh, I leave you the floor for your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's quite an honor to be uh, asked to. Um, lead off on this uh, panel and in fact to have in some sense the panel topic uh, sparked by your uh, spontaneous reading of my, of my book uh, uh, called Public Management as Design uh, Oriented uh, uh, Professional Discipline. Now um, uh, it's also good to see uh, some uh, old friends, some of you I've talked through these ideas with at an earlier stage, uh, like Nuno, and hopefully you'll see that things have uh, sort of uh, come to fruition uh, after, uh, after some years. So the idea is that I'm, I'm gonna run through um, some of, I think, the uh, important ideas that will be um, a basis for future uh, discussions, uh, whether we're talking specifically about public management, 
which I take more to be a professional discipline within public administration than anything else, uh, or whether you're interested in uh, certain debates about the, uh, the field of uh, management. Uh, I know that they're relevant to the field of management generally from my time as head of department and thinking about the identity of a department um, that included economists and OB people and information systems and so on and so forth. Uh, but fortunately, um, I, I left that role and could work on this uh, book, so I haven't thought about all of the, uh, all of the issues. So uh, the, the hope is to um, set up a discussion. Um, I'm going to run through uh, some slides pretty uh, quickly. Um, don't worry, Xavier, I'll get, it, get through them. Uh, and uh, you'll see some uh, kind of strange diagrams, but I, I think they'll grow on you. I'm not going to pause to go very slowly. I'm just going to go through, and if there's things you want to pick up on later, well, pick up, pick up on them uh, later. So let me um, move ahead. Um, right. So this uh, this book is a you know a, the genre is a manifesto book. Okay. Uh, it proposes um, what today I would call a, a constitution for uh, my field of public management, uh, being one as I suggested. Uh, sitting inside of public administration, but different from the other disciplines, academic disciplines uh, within the field. So, um, but a property of my uh, manifesto uh, book is that it does look uh, to the past um, on the grounds that you can't shape the future without putting into question the past and you can't shape the future without uh, putting things, putting ideas from the past together in new ways uh, that people could understand and more than understand, find themselves in some accord with. Okay. So um, um, uh, today I particularly want to bring you to the past. That's where the reference to the medical model comes in. That's not what I see as part of the future. I see that as an important part of the past of the, of the field, uh, as do uh, some uh, scholars who have written critically about the past uh, of the field, who I'll be mentioning uh, shortly. Um, in, in a way then, the, the genre of today's presentation uh, is, is not really about the manifesto. Uh, you can uh, read that. It's more about the, the history. Now, there's a term I picked up in the political science, critical literature on the political science discipline recently called forensic history. And that just means a history of the debates uh, within the field, uh, within the academic field. Um, and not, it, it attends to the historicity of the debates, but it's also there to um, gain intellectual understanding of the content of the debate so that, that the good points of that debate can be recycled, uh, different parts of the debate can be combined in new ways. So this, what I am doing today is a little exercise in forensic history about the management field relying almost entirely on uh, somebody else's work, um, March and uh, Ogier's work. But uh, I'm giving it a, a kind of essentialist twist so that we can take that work by others in forensic history and management and have our own conversations, um, uh, our own debates, present and future. And I think that will help you uh, at a very least in terms of my own agenda, understand uh, the historical basis of my manifesto for public management. Okay. Uh, so just uh, to indicate, uh, I mean, this is my book. Uh, this is the, uh, the contents, it's open access. All you have to do is go to elgaronline.com, put in my name and the whole thing will pop up and you can download it. Um, this is chapter two, and chapter two covers uh, the, the historical period of, uh, of the formation of modern management and its relationship to uh, a more traditional, uh, but still very good, uh, Harvard Business School uh, approach. And then I uh, attempt to combine uh, uh, two ideas, Harvard and Simon, and call that uh, a design-oriented professional discipline, broadly speaking. And I'll be um, putting some meat on those words as we uh, proceed. So uh, here's the book that I, is my main source. And I know other people have written other books about this history. Of, I haven't read them as carefully as I've read this. This one really uh, grabbed me. Uh, the, uh, the, the first author you may or may not know, the second one you surely will, Jim March, 
This book was published in 2011, so uh, quite late in life. Not only is it a forensic history of, uh, of the field of management uh, in the United States, uh, North America, they claim, but it is also a long lament about how things turned out uh, by March. And then there are some other uh, sub-discussions about what might have been two or three um, counterfactual two or three page stories of how management could have unfolded as a discipline, but for some of the history that they tell. Um, and none of those is exactly the one I'm telling, uh, interestingly enough, and certainly mine is more than two or three pages. But as you all know, okay, uh, uh, one of the traditional approaches uh, and one that figures very prominently in the US uh, tradition is that of uh, Harvard Business School. And we know the dates when it was uh, up and running and everybody knows about the case method. And you probably all know that the case method uh, was borrowed um, from Harvard Law School, uh, where uh, uh, the uh, very practice of developing common law lawyers uh, took a very specific form starting around uh, 1890. And uh, the, the key thing you got to remember about that is that the, uh, the idea in the law school was you were training professional lawyers and professional lawyers you know, how to deal with every, all sorts of cases on the basis of all sorts of material. And the key thing was to develop the judgment, judgment, legal judgment of the lawyer and going through case after case after case, pretending you're a judge uh, under instruction uh, and uh, Socratic dialogue with a professor would develop your judgment. That's a very old idea. Uh, it's part of the casuistical uh, tradition of moral reasoning. Uh, very nicely written up by uh, Johnson and uh, Toulmin in, uh, in their book, The Abuse of Casuistry. So there's a, there's, a, there's a history to the history to the history to the history of these things, and that is a general point uh, to keep in mind. Um, now, this may be a little bit of a strange diagram, um, but uh, it'll grow on you. Uh, uh, this I call a pentagram that is based, uh, as I'll explain in a minute, on um, uh, uh, Kenneth Burke's uh, um, uh, dramatism and the method of dramatistic analysis that uh, he developed in his, uh, in his work. Um, uh, this is, just think of this as a, a kind of general speech situation, but I've augmented it and twisted it and done a little bit of an extension. So you can see that the, the key thing I want to bring out here is that uh, uh, the, there's a view of practice that kind of holds together. Um, uh, people who are in these roles uh, have acquire um, ways of acting in front of others based on sort of archetypes of management and, uh, and that role behavior conditions how they appear before others in kind of a Goffmanian sense. Uh, uh, it is true that they thought that uh, people would develop some expertise through their education and their and in particular their experience uh, when they act they're engaging in practical argumentation on answering a what to do question question in a particular scene with, with particular agents involved in particular purposes in mind, and so on and so forth. And as they act, they are drawing on what they've built up as their judgment, okay? Uh, so when I say expertise broadly defined, I mean more judgment, uh, clearly defined, the judgment of a business person. And, um, and they have other agency things that they bring to bear. Uh, I remember talking to uh, Jim Barron at, at Yale about management, and he said, well, the problem with our students is they think that uh, between their authority and their charm, they'll be able to get anything done, and they'll get out into the real world, and they'll find that they have too little of each. Uh, but uh, uh, there was this idea between your charisma of office and your personal charisma and your judgment, you'll get, get stuff done, and everything will be fine. Um, uh, I hope that uh, we can come back to this Pentad thing. I've been discovered it only about three or four months ago. Now everybody who has any contact with me for more than 30 minutes or perhaps less finds out about the Pentad. Uh, uh, it comes from Kenneth Burke. I don't know if you've heard of Kenneth Burke, but he dropped out of Columbia in 1918, went to Greenwich Village, became a literary critic, eventually became a very well-known um, kind of a philosopher in a way. Uh, father of the new rhetoric, if you've heard of that. Um, uh, there's lots of glosses on his work, particularly in the field of rhetoric. Um, but uh, um, some people have other, uh, also picked it up. A wonderful book about him is, uh, his work is this one. Uh, I put my uh, notes into, on this in the chat window. So uh, 
this is the email you were supposed to get me. <laughs> okay, so anyway, I'm gonna just use it rather than uh, you know, dwell on it here, but it's obvious you could use this for almost anything. Developing a talk like this, you know, I'm the agent, you've already begun to see my act. I think you want, you see the outcome I want is for you to read my book, that's scene purpose ratio, right? I'm using all sorts of resources of persuasion, including, you know, things like this, okay? Um, you, uh, once you'll fall in love with it. Now, uh, the other, uh, in this book, OGA and March um, identify a very particular, very important turning point in the field of management um, dated around uh, 1949, 1950, late uh, post-World War II period. Uh, and then an, uh, important um, uh, part of that story was the uh, foundation, the establishment, I should say, of the Graduate School of Industrial Administration at Carnegie Institute of Technology. Almost all of you will have probably come across this story. What you um, uh, don't know, perhaps, uh, and I didn't know before I read the book, is that the uh, kind of the funding for this project to create a modern management school, self-described or described by the Ford Foundation, was the Ford Foundation money. Ford Foundation you know, paid people and gave, uh, to develop the idea of the modern management school, to put out a report in its, uh, kind of in its name, um, and to fund uh, a lot of the GSIA in its early uh, days. Uh, you may not know, uh, as I didn't before I read this book, that the um, kind of the, the governing idea was that the modern management school should be patterned on the modern medical school. Okay. In fact, um, in um, around 1910, the Ford Foundation, uh, when it was just when it was family controlled, funded a project to create the modern medical school uh, in, the, uh, in the United States, specifically at Johns Hopkins uh, University. And uh, just like there was this report in 1949 by the Ford Foundation on Modern Management, so too there was a report funded by the Ford Foundation in 1910 called the Flexner Report. And you can see uh, Mr. Flexner up there and, uh, uh, and on the web, how the Flexner Report whipped medical education uh, into, into shape. So uh, this uh, was an important part of the story, uh, the, uh, clearly, the, um, there was an adaptation uh, of the management, uh, modern management school, but the, the concept was preserved in many respects. Okay? Uh, adaptation, instead of having biologists and chemists and so on, and biochemists uh, uh, employed full time to uh, develop uh, medical knowledge on the, in, through scientific means, uh, GSIA hired, a, hired some economists. Uh, and a few psychologists. And so you can see how uh, that might uh, unfold uh, as, uh, as a plan. So, um, well, that leads one to think, well, what is it exactly that this medical model uh, uh, consisted in? And well, it consisted in an idea of practice, obviously, and then it consisted in an idea of how you develop uh, through education modern medical practitioners and that of course that had implications for how you uh, do research and how and what the relationship would be between uh, research teaching development of practitioners and professional practice uh, if you're going to have a kind of manifesto project for um, uh, modern medical, modern management, you need to cover all of those bases, right? What's practice? What's education? What's research? And what do they have to do with one another? And these little uh, uh, pen pads will help you keep all of that straight. So this is just for um, modern medical um, practice. The uh, only thing I really want to um, emphasize uh, here is that um, is, is this thing between agency and act, so-called agency act ratio, okay, they were, when you're treating, when you're doing your work, uh, when you're being a professional medical person, you're doing a couple of things, you're figuring out what's wrong. That's a matter of judgment in a way, but it's a kind of technical judgment, uh, call that diagnostic argumentation, and then you have to decide what course of treatment 
That's a practical argument. So you could see how that would travel quite nicely. You know, the manager is supposed to diagnose situations and problems in, in the enterprise and then argue what would be a remedy uh, for them uh, or what would be the uh, adequate uh, course of action given the uh, functions that had to be performed by the enterprise. That's what I have under functions are under act purpose given which are governed by the, by the purpose. And then you develop people so that when they come to uh, their work, they can actually work in the presence of others and be successful. So then you have the implications for um, uh, medical education. Key thing here uh, to mention uh, is again, just focusing on this act agency and act purpose ratios. For the first couple of years, you're given science, okay? Uh, you learn biology, you learn chemistry, and so on and so forth. It's not really, it's certainly, you don't touch a patient. Okay. Uh, you don't develop any clinical understanding at that point. Obviously, things have been changing since the modern medical school, but that's, that's the one that influenced the modern management school. And so the first few years, you, you're supposed to think like a scientist and absorb a lot of new information. Well, that's one of the things they wanted people to do in, in, uh, in management. Then they had their opportunity to, you know, to practice, to actually do grand rounds and uh, attend patients and so on and so forth. And then they could learn how to engage in their diagnostic and practical argumentation. At that point, right, in principle, drawing on what they had learned before, right? So the outcome of, uh, the, of the first process was to be able to draw on best medical practice that they, uh, medical best practice that they had been taught in, a, in the classroom. And behind that, um, scientific knowledge about uh, biology and medicine. I should begin to think, I didn't hear anything like that in the in Harvard stuff, okay? That thing over there on agency sounded quite different, okay? The agency act thing, that is pretty similar. You got practical argument there. I just threw in diagnostic to make it clear that this is medicine. Okay, but a lot of, uh, uh, so there's some things that are different and a lot of things are preserved. And my point is with these kind of diagrams, we can just kind of begin to compare in a, a sort of a non, uh, sort of strident way, uh, um, these different approaches okay? and see what's similar and what's different. So you just, just as a, as a sort of presentational device, you can throw them together and start saying, oh, okay, what's, Ah, part one, okay, what's the difference here? Okay, the outcome of the first is they get, uh, learn a lot about biology, then they're trading on that as they act. Okay, okay so back to the GSIA uh, story. Well, part of it is they hired a lot of economists, um, many of whom got Nobel Prizes, Franco Modigliani being, uh, sorry for the pronunciation, being one of them. And, uh, uh, and a lot of these guys were recruited from Chicago, which wasn't very far away. At the time, the uh, Coles Foundation, the Coles Commission for Research and Economics, which in 1963 moved to Yale because they couldn't put up with Friedman, was still there in, in Chicago. That's, um, and so a lot of the culture of Chicago and economics um, uh, were built into the DNA of uh, GSIA. Um, uh, now, uh, one of the people, um, and that had all sorts of implications. First of all, the people who were like the biologists and chemists were economists, right? They just loved it. Right? And the idea is, of course, they were going to teach economics instead of biology uh, and, uh, uh, and develop, you know, uh, best practice models for finance and operations management and uh, marketing and so on and so forth. And so that's where all of this comes from. You will notice um, uh, um, my pointer here, uh, about on the, just above to the upper right of the uh, A and GSIA is Herbert Simon as a younger man. Um, so he was, uh, he was not part of, well, he was part of Coles, although he was at that point uh, at the Illinois Institute of Technology. So he floats in, although he wasn't exactly an economist. He got, got along with them. He was a little bit different, you know. Um, uh, but came along for the ride and was obviously an important figure in, in, the, in the tradition there. Um, and uh, Jim March uh, shows up uh, after he gets his PhD in political science uh, from Yale in the, in the 50s at some point. And so that's, this, some of this is a book, is a autobiographical account, very interesting to, uh, to read. 
So, well, this is the modern management uh, idea as far as I can essentialize it uh, from, uh, from reading, uh, reading the book. Um, and uh, so there were, I think, a sense that uh, uh, the disciplines um, could furnish uh, not only a kind of uh, orientation uh, to modern management, the details of which you could easily fill in, but also a kind of idea that there, is, there were rules uh, that were pretty reliable uh, for making decisions um, within an enterprise, uh, given uh, fairly stable and clear ideas of the purpose of the enterprise. Okay? You can imagine that being particularly true in finance. Um, but the, they sought similar kinds of technological rules. Now that term comes from uh, Mario Bunhe, not from anything I read in this, but that seemed to be the, the, the orientation. And so um, uh, the, uh, the manager uh, would, would trade on okay, their, uh, their culture and their understanding of these technological rules as they, as they confronted actual situations, and they would make the case for doing one thing or another. And what was privileged was uh, what Charles Tilly calls technical accounts, as opposed to stories or opposed to general principles or, or codes, as opposed, uh, um, and, and that was privileged, okay? Making arguments that are laced with technical arguments. So they're clear uh, goals uh, um, and uh, some cause effect arguments that you could either see right on the surface or probe quite closely, well, that's what you would, that's a very close imitation of modern medicine, right? This is not a carbon copy, but a very close uh, emulation. Now, Simon, well, what I didn't know <laughs> before I read this book uh, was Simon was a, became a huge dissenter against the modern management school. I mean, he never joined with Harvard people, okay, but he left yeah, we know he left around 1960 or the early 60s. I mean, March left before that. Okay, something went wrong. Okay. Uh, and it turned out that uh, he was a uh, vociferous critic internally to uh, that idea of, I mean, not the whole idea, obviously. I mean, much of it he could be happy with, but some of the aspects of that paradigm he was against. He became against. Now, he put it. Uh, now, what we can see, we can see that from the, from the account in the book, first-hand account from uh, March, but we can also read into it if we, uh, if we look at Science is the Artificial, in particular Chapter 5, which I'll come to, which was addressed to engineers, but it turned out that was like allegorical in the sense that he was saying the same things uh, that he was saying to the engineers in Science is the Artificial, uh, to his colleagues in the modern management school. But I had no idea about that until uh, uh, the, you know, the match between those two things until I read March and, and Magia. So he had big questions about it. Um, and the one thing that they say in the book is that while um, uh, the sort of uh, lodestar of the uh, and model of the, of the economists was the modern medical school, okay, for Simon, the, the, the real model was the Manhattan Project, because the Manhattan Project was about creating big innovations that you know, really dealt with important problems, and it required, well, as innovations, creating things that didn't yet exist, and that's not making a decision, okay? There's much more to creating, you have to make decisions, but there's much more to creating something new than making a decision. Uh, of course, this goes along with his critique of economics and saying we ought to be focusing on search because search was his metaphor for creating something new. So he, um, um, and in the science of the artificial, he says you got to train engineers to be designers. Well, he maybe was making the same argument uh, in management. We need to train uh, managers to be problem solvers and that requires, in effect, not just getting them to be able to make decisions and lace their practical argument with uh, technical accounts, you got to do something more. Okay? So that's where the, all this stuff comes from, about that we all know from Simon. Okay? I'm conscious of the time, so I'll just uh, kind of run, run through it. So the, the thing that's uh, new here, and I'm picking up, I mean, there's a little bit of this in chapter one, but it's all over chapter five. Okay? 
Um, uh, there's lots of pentagrams in chapter five, but here's, here's one of them. Uh, uh, and it, it has to do with, again, this, you know, this uh, agency act ratio, right? I mean, what is going on? It's not just practical argumentation, but it is practical argumentation. There's a whole set of, there's a whole, I don't know, form of, uh, uh, of uh, engagement with the world that is called search and creativity. And that is not in the modern man man management school. And, as, and it's not formalized in the historical one either, the historical management one. Does it mean it's anathema to either of them? No, but it actually matters which you privilege, right? It hugely matters which idea you privilege in this agency act ratio. The other thing to note, um, Pascal might be particularly interested in this, that there's a, a notion that comes out, you can see it in Science of the Artificial and, and uh, especially um, Clive Dimes sort of rendition of it and other people's rendition of it, that it's important for the pr professional practitioner, because we're not talking about managers in the narrow, professional practitioners to be able to draw on forms of stocks of, I don't know what, what metaphor you want for it, knowledge uh, to classification, domain and design, okay? So design knowledge is what any practitioner, regardless of field, ought to be able to, ought to know so that they can participate in the search uh, for new um, systems and uh, other uh, artificial phenomena that are important to fulfilling the purposes of enterprises over the long run, okay? So um, everybody ought to be able to do that, including the, the manager. And then there's some very specific domain knowledge that any individual will be able to bring to bear. Perhaps managers will be able to bring management knowledge uh, to bear, although in the, he, he didn't really say what that was about too much. And he kind of threw a lot of management knowledge into the design knowledge category. And, chapter five. So it wasn't, it was a lot more to work out there, uh, but you can certainly uh, see the, uh, uh, that this was a particular idea. And then on the left hand side is a little detailing of, of these act scene ratios as I uh, get them. Uh, in particular, uh, I would actually, it's basically a detailing of the act purpose one. These are the functions that have to be performed somehow in an organization in order to uh, achieve innovation, uh, invention, and innovative change. Um, uh, and because of the starting point, you know, you have some engineers interested in the left-hand thing called design, you have managers interested in the right-hand thing called decision-making. Both functions have to get done, okay, or else you're never going to have the, the innovation uh, that you need. Okay? And then the interesting thing is you have to develop the design knowledge so people can participate in the actual activities that accomplish these functions. Okay? And that's the program. Not sure we've worked it out. So, I try to put these uh, ideas together. Um, you know, this is where the public management thing comes in. For the Harvard thing, I substitute uh, Mark Moore's book on creating uh, public value. It's very casuistical. It's, you know, you can see the history from um, 15th century casuistry to Harvard Law School, to Harvard Business School, to Duke Kennedy School, plain as day, if you know, if you've done any of this forensic work. And basically says, you know, the manager has in their head, you know, some orientation toward uh, um, what it is that a public organization should be for and what kind of imperatives there are that need to be satisfied somehow to uh, achieve their goal, uh, to deliver on their mandate more specifically, and, you know, furnish the capabilities that allow pro programs and campaigns to operate so that public value is created. Entirely, um, uh, and the practice is really for the public manager to have all of that in their head uh, uh, so that they can trade on their charm and what limited authority they have to do the kinds of things that eventuate in the capabilities of the organization of public value. So straightforward Harvard story. Very nice, very important. You know, I started with that stuff. I still kind of like it up to a point, although it doesn't give you a discipline and without a discipline, we're dead, okay? Uh, uh, on the right hand side is the Simon bit from the previous one. I just sort of put them together uh, in a slide, you know, in a table, whatever, in a diagram in chapter two. Uh, and the whole point, the detail, I mean, it's a very simple thing, but the, 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 the point is that if you're going to create something new, it, it better come from something old, okay, in new ways. And the 
particular way I threw it together, you can see a little bit of Harvard, a little bit of Simon, a little bit of Simon and Harvard. The thing in the middle is very specifically, uh, well, on the whole is from Simon. The thing on the top is from Fayol to Harvard. The thing on the bottom is uh, very, very much uh, Harvard in particular, emphasizing the development of a skillful professional abilities of sense making, argumentation, and dramatization in front of your colleagues. Uh, adap adapting this for the synthesis, throw in designing as a very important skillful professional ability, which was left out of the Harvard account. Um, Harvard account didn't have design process because it was so focused on individual practitioners doing their thing. On the other hand, Simon, you know, just uh, uh, did argumentation beautifully, but never said it was important, uh, and uh, kind of eschewed talking about the Thalian uh, functional approach, even though it was implicit in what he was doing. So here's a little synthesis, and I think we should do syntheses. Well, that's, this is what I've been up to in the, in the talk. You may have your own attitudes and issues that you would want to raise about the present in, in the field of management, if you'll have your own ideas about what the future should be. But we share something in common, I think, and that is the thing on the left-hand side called the past. And with that, I'll just conclude and, uh, and, uh, and uh, look forward to what colleagues have to say uh, about this. The only thing I'll say here is that if you draw the box around there, you, said you have the beginning of an idea of a discipline a design-oriented discipline, which for me is draws on and in some sense transcends uh, the uh, traditional uh, practice paradigm and the ideas about education uh, and research that are behind it. On the one hand, and the same thing for Simon, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I think with these tools, we can have a serious conversation of the past, present, and future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for this uh, time travel. And I think it's uh, it's, it's really compelling uh, presentation, especially uh, as a preparation or you know uh, companion to the reading of the book because it gives a lot of insight also about uh, some of the ideas about uh, which uh, the the book is based. Uh, but uh, not only that. So uh, I will uh, leave the floor first to to uh, Javier, then Pascal, and then myself. I will also have a a question for you. Uh, so Javier, do you want to go on with the first feedback? Sure, thank you so much Andrea and uh, hi everyone. It's really a pleasure to be in this session uh, to be discussing the um, insightful ideas and thinking of an old-time colleague uh, Michael Barzilai uh, and friend. So it's, it's really um, an you know, a special occasion for me. Um, I tried to come up with some ideas that I would like to share with you. Uh, I hope that you can see the slides. Um, so I would like to reflect uh, a little bit on what Michael has said and that I've had the chance to uh, listen in several sessions, training sessions, and I hope that I I managed to understand some of it, um, though I must admit that I have had limited time to uh, read the book and uh, the various documents that Michael has been so kindly sharing with me and he also shared with you. So um, what I would like to say to start with is that um, I think we very much need books like this which reflect about the basic models that have guided management and management thinking or the thinking about management. And uh, I'm very happy to see that in the audience, there is Thomas Durand, who is the past president of URAM and who has also thought a lot about this. And uh, you might find interesting to listen to his remarks uh, of the conference, uh, welcoming participants to the conference. I think I will be touching upon also drawing from some of his ideas uh, later on. Why it's important um, not only to reflect about the models that we have been using and drawing from, which guide our action as researchers and teachers and consultants, but it's also very important not just to understand, but to act 
And we do need a vision of how we should act. And this is rejoining the ideas about the debates, but also the manifestos. Manifestos, I think, are visions um, in some, to some extent of things that need to be changed, things which are valued uh, by those who endorse, write and endorse the manifesto. But we also need collective action. And so this is something that at your RAM we have been discussing extensively in the presidential activities. And this is what uh, Thomas Durand is also calling for in the introductory video to the, um, to the conference. This is harder. I think that Michael is really doing an amazing task, amazing work in offering us uh, such an insightful synthesis of the historical evolution drawing from uh, also March and Auger's work, obviously, but pushing us also to think about this idea of manifesto. And also the idea that he has more recently discussed and not so much today of a constitution. And when I think, and I, that's what I'm gonna be mostly talking about, I'm gonna be talking about what Michael taught me in 1995, 96, when I was a young doctoral student at ESABE in Barcelona. And I distinctively remember that seminar, learning about the analysis of analogies and metaphors, reading Lakoff. And so I think that constitution is a political metaphor, a political analogy. And actually it, it's thought provoking because if we look at what constitution stands to be, I think, and I'm not a political scientist, but they are a compendium of rights and maybe also obligations for the citizens of a community, of a state, but they also provide um, design for the uh, distribution of powers and roles among different actors, very important actors of the state, drawing from Montesquieu, usually the legislative, the judiciary, and the uh, executive. And I think we might need actually something like that in the field. I think we might need an actual constitution to state what are the values and the rights of us as scholars. Um, and I think that that would be very useful. So I don't know if that's what Michael has in mind. We have talked a little bit about it in the session preparing this symposium, but this is something that probably I would like, you know, I, I think it's very important that we'd like to hear about. Now, you know, in the, <laughs> in the rec uh, recollection of the history of our field, Michael mentioned this important role of the far four foundation. So I'm wondering, do we need another foundation report. Of course, in Europe, we have the European Foundation for Management Development, um, which is a body that represents the business schools, the management schools. Uh, it's not a corporation, such as in the four case, I mean, uh, four foundation linked, I guess, to the corporation. So that's something to also to think about. And also, maybe I would ask Michael and others whether they think that this could be undertaken. So the book and, and what Michael uh, has, I think, uh, has mentioned is proposing a new approach to public management as a design oriented, and I won't talk much about design, I will leave that to Pascal, professional discipline. I'm not sure that the word discipline is the right one, Michael. I might beg <laughs> there to differ um, in the sense that I think when we think about disciplines, we think more about the um, basic um, units of science, let's say the social sciences, uh, social di disciplines, economics, um, sociology, psychology, and so on. I think I would rather talk about field to make the distinction between the field and the disciplines that the field might draw from. But professional is very important. And this actually was the core of our presidential activities this year, how we can better address corporate and managerial challenges. And practice means action in the relevant field. How can we help managers undertake their action as managerial practitioners? 
I, I also like to say that we are also practitioners, but academic practitioners, um, and sometimes even consultants. And this actually relates to the issues of impact and relevance, not only of our research, but also of our teaching. Here I'm, I'm drawing uh, from Thomas's observation in, in the presidential activity that there are also limits of, of the rationality, and this is actually the notion that, that Simon introduced, bounded rationality. And Thomas likes to reserve the word judgment precisely to this uh, situation in which even if we engage in sophisticated decision-making, trying to reduce uncertainty with scenario building, for instance, we still face limits. Uh, there's still remaining unquantifiable uncertainty and there is still ignorance. So just to say that maybe, you know, we should also recognize that, that there might be mistakes. And I, I'm very pleased to see Terry McNulty in the audience who is uh, working on, on business judgment and the limits of business judgment and how actually courts adjudicate, judges adjudicate when, when there has been uh, a negligence or it's within the limits of the limitations of um, managerial and human rationality. Indeed, this that Michael offers for the public management, I think it's, it's generalizable to the, fit, to the whole field of management. And I think that, and this, this is gonna be uh, my main point of analysis, is that here um, in the retrospective exercise of um, through Berg's Pentads of other professional fields, we are engaging in analogical thinking. And I would like to uh, reflect about, again, uh, maybe in trying to be a rather, um, I don't know if a good student, but, uh, but reflecting what I think I learned uh, several years ago. Uh, we have engineering and we have medicine and then we have management. So I'll try to go fast through this. So engineering, and again, I'm not an expert in this, so, but I'm just trying to uh, reflect in a very synthetic way. The goal is to design or to create useful, effective artifacts or tools. It draws from disciplines, from scientific disciplines, I guess from, mainly from physics, to understand the behavior of things. But these things are just physical, <laughs> are only material. Medicine, in contrast, tries to improve the health of humans, or more broadly, all kinds of animals, in general. Obviously, the, the definition of health changes over time, is socially constructed as we have seen with mental health. It draws from the understanding of human beings and other animals, biology, anatomy, physics, pharmacology. And it deals with these physical, but also biological organisms, which have also social dimension. And that's where uh, psychology is also important, I guess, for medicine. Maybe they should, all doctors should be trained somewhat in, in, in psychology, I'm not sure they are. Um, what about management? Well, management is supposed to assist in the exercise of practice to managers as individuals, but also to try to improve the health, the functioning of organizations or some of their units. And here again, the goals change over time. What we mean by effectiveness changes depending on the nature of the organization, but also over time, even for the same kind of organization, such as corporations, the discussion over the shareholder primacy and CSR. It's supposed to draw from understanding from disciplines that try to understand the behavior of human beings and their social dynamics, collective action, in formal organizations. And it deals with physical and biological organisms. Sometimes we forget, nowadays we talk more about resilience, physical stamina, and work and life balance in, in a social context. The social dimension is really more and more important here, more, much more important than in medicine. So I think that the challenges that we face is that maybe these fields of professional practice in which there is indeed diagnosis, as, as Michael was pointing out, and discretion at, at using whatever the findings of diagnosis or the diagnostic phase are, these two fields differ from the field of managerial practice. The nature of the object, obviously, the social dimension, it, in management, it's basically social objects. Of course, the physical and the bi biological and the um, uh, stratum are important, but the political and social dynamics are paramount. We have a fundamental problem of observing and furthermore, accessing the object, right? In our field, we have 
a lot of problems of accessing the actual object organizations in particular as it regards to political dynamics at a higher level, for instance, when we deal with corporate governance. Intervening, well, it's related to the, you know, to the um, prior dimension. We have a rather low power of intervention. Managers themselves can do internal changes and consultants can also. Uh, we all now see that researchers trying to conduct experiments within organizations, but this is very, very difficult because of access, right? And creation in the design sense, uh, that's the main focus of engineering. Medicine, I don't think has gotten so far, right? Maybe artificial intelligence will get there. Um, and in our field, I think that maybe we, what we could do is to let leverage the uh, incubators and accelerators in universities because entrepreneurs, right, are those creating new objects in our field, new organizations, the startups. And in a way, maybe they are, um, you know, we could train them as, and study them scientifically as, and, you know, as some of people are doing, like Alfonso Gambardella and others on, on uh, entrepreneurial decision making. So that's what I had to say. Um, and I'm sorry if I took a bit more time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Javier. Um, I don't know if, uh, Michael, you want to, to reply to any of this stimuli? Otherwise we have... Uh... Uh, not yet, anyway. Okay. We collect uh, also some ideas from Pascal at this point. Yes, thank you. Uh, second, share my screen. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, thank you for the invitation, Andrea. Uh, it was a real pleasure to honestly to discover your work, Michael. Uh, I, I read it carefully uh, and I discovered a lot of things, including on Simon, uh, uh, someone I read a lot, uh, studied a lot, uh, much more from the, from the um, innovation and uh, design perspective. And what you describe regarding his position toward GSI, uh, GSIA and uh, Manhattan Project uh, was really enlightening, I guess. So thanks a lot. Uh, and also, thanks a lot for discovering this uh, design orientation in public management. Um, Andrea invited me, uh, not because I am an expert in public management, but uh, I was at that time the chair of the Innovation SIG, and uh, I'm working a lot on, on design, design methods, design organization, and design theory. And of course, I read your book from this perspective, and uh, trying to understand a kind of parallel between what we lived in, in the innovation management community and what you describe as the history of uh, public management and management education. So, uh, and maybe what I try to do uh, is precisely to draw this parallel and to, to then raise questions based on this analogy. And so where is design paradigm in innovation management? Uh, the first point is, where is it coming from? In, in innovation management, we needed a design paradigm because of the new questions. Uh, Javier just uh, explained that we were dealing with new objects in the society. We had to deal with new kind of innovation. And, and this was not easy. easy. Uh, usually you, can, you consider that an innovation project this is uncertainty and you have to reduce uncertainty of state gate processes and whatever. You can coordinate this and you can solve problems uh, all, the, uh, all the way long. You have to design something that is uh, a, a, new, uh, a new way to face climate change, a new kind of smart mobility or smart cities. So the, the question of the unknown emerged and for people in charge of managing this, project leader, innovation uh, leader, depart uh, department leaders, etc. The, the point was how, what, how could I think about this? What is my way to think about it? If I try to decide on this, I just don't know whether it's possible or not possible. I can't just evaluate what is a smart city. There is no smart city, I have to design them. So how could I think in this situation? And not only that, how could I make people think in this situation? 
And immediately you have a lot of aporia image emerging. Uh, people say, well, you say it's unknown, but anyhow, in the end, the solution you will provide will be made of things that are known. So just a combination. Should we think about innovation and knownness as a combination? And the point is, no, you can't. It's not enough. It's a, it's a combination, but a combination of a very special kind that is exactly the dialogue we had with, with Simon. Um, you had a lot of own conclusiveness too. People said, you should try and learn, but try what? What is a relevant experience in the unknown? Is the same experience valid in the unknown as in uncertainty? And the answer is no. You, you don't run the same trials if you are in the unknown and if you are in uncertainty. So we had all this issue to solve, and this is why we needed a new firm ground. Uh, shifting from decision-making, the classical language of decision-making, to the language of design uh, thinking. There's a lot of uh, question mark. Um, here, uh, we also, uh, and this is maybe one point of discussion, uh, we of course went back to Simon. Uh, Science of the Artificial was at that time the most universal language of describing the way to go through the unknown. But we also discovered that Simon is not enough. And a lot of papers have been written in innovation on saying that Simon, Science of the Artificial, in something like an unfinished program. This is a fantastic program, but unfinished. And the, the challenge for the, the community in innovation management in design society was rather to push design theory a bit further to be able to, to have a better logic for describing the way we travel in the unknown. Uh, so with this, we were able to provide new analytical capacity uh, to put names on uh, phenomena in innovation, like uh, functional expansion, the laws of fixation. And we were also able to have new prescription capacity. Uh, we were able to describe new kinds of leaders new kind of evaluation, economics evaluation, etc. And of course, this uh, led to a lot of results, uh, just to mention, because I am, of course, very proud of this. Uh, I, I edited last year with my colleague Annabel Gewer and Maria Enquist, uh, precisely a, a, a special issue in the European Academy of Man Ma European Management Review uh, on the innovation theory and, the, and how it can refund the, the management. So how facing the unknown, might help to, to refund re uh, management. So in a way, uh, we, we had a kind of a discussion together through this. Um, and, and now, uh, just drawing a kind of stupid parallel, but my point, my questions would be, well, uh, you suddenly say, you say we should come back to this uh, design-oriented uh, discipline. And of course, I fully agree. And my point was whether if you say this in public management, is it also related to the fact that public management is confronted today to certain form of unknown? Uh, of course, pandemic, we know about COVID, which is a, a terrible unknown, uh, but also other public issues, uh, inequalities, uh, new kind of democracies, media, new kind of labors. We see a lot of unknown issues in public management and maybe your, your approach uh, might be particularly uh, relevant to tackle those uh, issues. And, and here, I, I fully follow you. Um, it's not sure that the, uh, the, the medical model is adapted to this. The, the level of unknownness for a doctor is not exactly this one. A, a doctor, he has to apply rules, etc. And, and Simon was perfectly right by saying, be careful with this medical model it's not sure that we really address the unknown of the future. So, and I just wanted to, to hear you about this. The second point is you built on Simon and we in innovation management consider that it was not sufficient. And my point was, uh, what is your opinion on this? Uh, you, you probably know about Argeri's Dorst, Grandori, actual proposition on uh, extending, expanding uh, design theory. What is your, your position on this? Uh, how, what is a relevant design theory for public management? Uh, maybe the, the, the design theory we have today is too generative. It's covering too many things. Uh, what is a relevant design theory for, for uh, public management? And, and here, maybe just a point for, for Javier. I, I think that you, we probably need a design theory, and this is what will grant a discipline. Uh, you were uh, discussing the point, of, is it a, a profession or is it a discipline? 
I have the impression that what, you, what Michael is saying is that we, we should be a discipline and we need firm ground to be a discipline. And uh, drawing still the parallel, uh, design and innovation and design and public management. I was wondering who are the actors of design and public management? There are 10,000 engineers for designing one car um, or for designing cars in just one engineering department, 10,000 engineers. Um, how many people, designers, in charge of designing healthcare system, designing education system? Who are those people? How are they organized? Um, what, what are the crafts and how do we study them? What is our access to the field and to these people? I, I was really interesting to, to, to listen to you on this. And, and also, still during the paradigm, if we go on a design paradigm in public management, what are the consequences? Does it mean that the, the, the so-called decision makers are now design supporters? Uh, how, what are the consequences for educating those people? We have generations of leaders educated in making decisions. What about dealing with the unknown when you can't decide, when you are confronted to the undecidable? So the question of education is here in the book, but I wanted to, to listen to you a bit more on this. And another direction is, the, the, decision, the, sorry, the design capacities in public management, uh, we, you speak a lot on, on uh, uh, administrators and people in the administration. What about citizens? Uh, they, they might be part of the game. Uh, are they uh, strong enough to be designer? Uh, can we say that everybody can design? What are the design capabilities of or uh, of the citizens of our countries. So, well, just questions to, to open the field. Thank you very much, Pascal. <clears throat> I would like to add a very short point to this, a very direct question. And uh, since you mentioned the professional practice and training uh, very much related to the practical aspect of this, uh, also building up on uh, uh, the, the evolution of uh, business schools that Michael was uh, as described in his speech, but also the focus on disciplines that Javier pointed out uh, and the focus on the role of design uh, that Pascal very clearly and very inspiringly pointed out now. Uh, because actually we, we, we would have a model in public management, uh, which I mean, would, uh, should have the same uh, um, role uh, and the same aim of the business schools, which are, for instance, the national the model of the national schools of administration, right? Uh, so I, I was wondering where do they fit, uh, in, in your opinion, Michael, in the, in this uh, model of evolution? Because of course they they have a very different uh, origin and they they come from very different uh, scopes and aims. Uh. Uh, but I, I do think that this kind of uh, um, inputs you know, that uh, uh, you have been providing so far uh, should be probably useful and interesting for uh, a redesign of the, uh, of the model of uh, uh, national schools of administration. We, we know that they come from a very different background in terms of disciplines, in terms of area, because it's very context dependent but they are increasingly dealing with the, uh, with the management issues. So not only the economics or the low one. So I was just simulated by your feedbacks. I was wondering about this aspect. Well, uh, how do you want to run this? Because we have other people. Um, I mean, if you gave me 10 minutes at the end or something like that, um, I could touch on a lot of these points and it would uh, serve the purpose of jumping off into a lot of future conversations. But uh, you want to collect some other questions first? Yeah, of course, of course. Let's open the floor for uh, any other comments or ideas. First, thank can you. I, can I jump? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry about that. Okay, let me put my camera on. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for the presentation it's, uh, and the discussion. It's a very interesting topic and, and I, I really uh, learned a lot. 
Uh, obviously, I didn't read the book, didn't read the book yet, but I promise I shall because I'm very interested. Um, now, if I turn to some um, uh, uh, first, a critical point, uh, j just for the sake of, of saying it, it's obvious, baby, and, and you clearly uh, uh, express the context in which you do your work. Yet, it, this orientation is very US based. Uh, so, it, it provides an interesting uh, story, narrative, which is compelling, about where we come from, seen from the US and within the US. But there are other parts of the world which also have a past and also have a future. So how would you relate that to, to uh, the, the other context? It's interesting to, to mention you're based obviously in Europe, but there is also Asia. I mean, the Japanese economy uh, developed without necessarily uh, um, uh, the managerial perspective of the US. Uh, similarly in Germany, I mean, the success of the economy has been uh, uh, quite remarkable uh, with their own history in terms of, of management and the ways they see, view, and teach, or educate in management. Uh, then I, I have a quick uh, point, which sounds may sound a little bit uh, detailed, but I, I f don't fully understand. The word agency uh, has several meanings. And to me, agency is more linked to agency theory, namely the proactivity of, of agents. Um, I don't find that in your in the Penta uh, diagram, and I wondered whether you could comment on that. And and actually, proactivity, the ability, you know, that's the entrepreneurship that's very important in management. Uh, that's behind it. And and when we talk about designing new objects, it could be new forms of businesses new organizations, new business models, etc. Uh, it's also something where people or individuals need to have an engine within their guts, uh, so to speak. Uh, and and uh, proactiveness or proactivity is, is, is to me uh, what's behind agency and I don't find that. Uh, and, and this relates to the issue of, of uh, soft skills. If I may very quickly, uh, um, uh, Xavier, um, with engineering, you, you talk about physical objects where well, there is IS, information systems, where there is hardware, but also software, which reminds a bit of, uh, because we, you're using, Michael, a lot uh, of the idea of analogy or metaphors. Well, it, it's the psycho thing compared to, to biology and the body. Um, uh, well, we have the mind and, and, and the body, so it's yeah, parallel to engineering where there is a software uh, as well. Um, I'll stop there. Well, just comments and uh, your feedback on that. So, uh, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Duran. Yeah, Stefan. Thank you very much. Uh, first, thank you very much for this really insightful uh, symposium and a special thanks to Michael uh, to his presentation. Um, I totally agree with, with my own experience uh, ha ha having, having the fortune to spend some time at Harvard Business School, which is definitely the decision-making school and the strategy and go on. And then uh, one year after uh, some time at MIT, which is the design, the innovation school and how they teach management. So completely uh, different here. But isn't there um, something missing in between, especially in our times? So on the one side, uh, you have the decision making. On the other side, you have the design elements. And to, to connect both, um, uh, probably, especially in our times, you need uh, some kind of change or transformational management which is uh, putting that into practice. And that may connect to another discipline with the, which is uh, psychology. And I think if, if I got Toma right, combining the soft and the hard skills might go in, in, in the same direction here. So what are you thinking about? Is there, isn't there something in between, especially for the practice of management and, and also public management? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Stefan. Uh, we also have a question uh, uh, arriving from the chat. So, Kristen Reed, 
is making also a relevant point. Uh, she, she writes, I wonder how this model sits with the discussion that took place around disruptive innovation. And she, she cites a paper from Christensen 2015. Uh, do we have other, other comments or questions? Uh, Nuno, I saw you, you raise your, your hand. I believe uh, Bridget is before me, actually. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, go on, Bridget. Yeah, I don't see you all at the same time. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm following up on what Stefan is uh, suggesting, well, I also enjoyed very much the uh, presentation. Thank you, Michael and, and, and Pascal and uh, Xavier. Uh, I have three points. Uh, the first is uh, then uh, Stefan's point about the connection between decisions and, and design. Uh, uh, I've been doing research on how designers collaborate and cooperate with uh, companies. And uh, it's critical that decisions and, and design uh, practices are, are uh, connected. They're actually entangled. So it's not something that you first design and then you deliver over to a decision process. It's entangled in complex ways. And we need to capture that in our own point. And, and the next one is the roots of, of modern medicine. There is a, a, a kind of, a, maybe you could call it kind of silent medicine because there are several roots of modern medicine. So you have, um, for instance, uh, the barber surgeons that were very close to practices. Uh, so modern medicine also built, is also built on that, uh, the discipline, though it was not connected to science. Uh, so the, the science-oriented university education and the barbers uh, practicing, uh, uh, they had uh, rich practices. They, they, uh, uh, this was combined in medicine over time. And then you had the general practitioner. And in, the, in these times, we need to remember Semmelweis. He was a general practitioner, uh, but he um, uh, participated in the university um, uh, operating theaters. And you remember uh, about uh, how he was rejected his theories. So this is... Um, so uh, in medicine, you have a richer uh, practice than what's only coming from uh, kind of the only theoretical overemphasis on theory and under emphasis on the practices and, and, and the search. So, um, and then we're coming into, into the third point, the arts of professions. So it's, uh, we need to uh, relate to kind of the, the rich understanding of professions uh, over time. And when we are kind of expanding design and management, uh, in trying to include diversity, trying to include citizens, we need also to, to um, include uh, the dynamics between uh, the highly skilled uh, professionals uh, searching for new knowing and the mundane knowing. And if you remember Symbolize, he learned from a uh, uh, very mundane practice of uh, how to empty toilets in, in the old day, that they, they washed their hands in chlorine. So he had, he had uh, tried everything but not chlorine. So he discovered this through his dialogue. With, it, it was serendipitous. So, um, so we need to include all these when we are, uh, rightly so, what Michael suggests, that we, we expand uh, management science uh, in new ways. So that was my point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, very much, Birgit. Uh, Nuno? Yeah, uh, thank you, Andrea. Um, Thank you, uh, Michael, for the excellent presentation. You always make it impossible for me not to learn something new. So and, uh, that was the same again today uh, about the stories about Simon. Now I know that I need to think that he was talking about two managers, not two engineers. So I have to update my thinking. But thank you uh, very much. I um, just have a couple of um, points and they touch upon on issues that uh, Javier uh, mentioned before, I believe. 
And is, uh, I would like to start with this notion of um, enterprise intent, which appears in one of the, I think, probably second to last slide. Uh, but just to know a bit more about, because I, I think it plays a key role in the, in the framework. And I would like to um, know more about that notion for two reasons. Uh, the first one is to uh, connect, you know, connecting to this conversation about we have the legal schools or the law schools, we have the medical schools, and what does it mean? Uh, then the question is, when it comes to intent or enterprise intent, what does it tell us about uh, adapting or thinking about medical school models, law school models to models in management schools? Because an organizations might have a different intent, and I'm having a very loose interpretation of intent here. So how can we train managers for uh, organizations with different intents or multiple intents, and what does it mean? And the second point, and that connects to this notion of enterprise intent, uh, is about, just like to know more about uh, from you, Michael, how do you think in terms of training uh, managers? Because if I look at uh, the pentadiagrams, which is a nice addition, uh, then um, it seems to me that if I would uh, build some sort of a curriculum for a, for a, for a, say a management program, I would definitely have courses or elements about how to present, how to uh, dramatize and things like that, which would be quite different from what we currently have. So that'll be starting from theory and conceptual and then to actually master the art of communicating. Uh, and, in, in, you know, uh, so I would like to, to know more about because also collects, of course, the notion of intent uh, and how you can fulfill or deliver to that intent in the enterprises. So these are my two reactions, but thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Okay, thank you very much, Nuno. Uh, well, I guess we have about 10 minutes left uh, till the uh, official end of the session and then uh, Probably, I think Michael will uh, also be available for some more minutes if uh, anyone wants to, to, to hang out uh, within the session. But I would leave some minutes to, to, to Michael uh, if he wants to you know, wrap up a little bit. A lot of the inputs that have been, uh, and I think they've been very useful, that have been brought forward uh, by our participants. Well, thank you uh, for all of that. I could thank individual people for individual points, but then <clears throat> I wouldn't get a chance to say anything, uh, say anything else. I will try to touch on uh, something that struck me from each, uh, each comment. But I think uh, not to get lost in, um, you know, this kind of wide ranging uh, discussion, uh, might I just say a little bit of the problem I'm, I was trying to solve in this book, okay? Um, and that, that may help me, um, let me, let me actually spend the time on that and then try to connect people's comments to it rather than uh, pick them up one by one. Uh, okay, well, I kind of explained what it is in chapter um, one um, in that uh, there's some history, personal auto, autobiographical history here, right? I mean, I was, uh, came out of, I went to Yale, I did a master's in public and private management, I got a PhD in political science. Uh, I was a very promising young man with my PhD of 25 and got hired at the Kennedy School of Government and spent 20, uh, 10 years there. Um, I was recruited into public management. I actually applied for a different job, but that's the job I got. Um, and uh, didn't get tenure and uh, one of the issues was uh, uh, well, one issue was my research, and the other uh, was um, the dean didn't even know if it was a field. Well, it doesn't matter if it's field or discipline, right, <laughs> at this point, okay? You know, well, it seems to me a little bit like a methodology, you know, like statistics or something like that. I mean, not something you would actually tenure somebody in, right? Uh, and then other people said, well, you know, I really can't uh, this was like uh, 94, right? Well, how do I tenure you and not uh, um, David Osborne? You know, or somebody like that. You know, the difference between the academy and the non-academy was even up for grabs. So, I mean, that was the conditions I was living in when I showed up here uh, in 1995. And um, um, uh, it took a while to work through that. Uh, one of the things that helped was uh, Larry Lynn's book called Public Management as Art, Science, and Profession. 
Um, he, uh, the punchline was that public management should present itself and think of itself as a profession rather than either an art or a science. Um, uh, he also had a very effective uh, critique of uh, the Kennedy School's version of Harvard Business School. So I, uh, that sort of hit home. And I was looking for alternatives. Uh, um, one alternative that came to mind uh, uh, was uh, those, that of uh, Eugene Bardak, uh, who was a kind of mentor person uh, for, for me. And he, uh, he was developing these ideas about design and both public management and public policy. Um, but nobody could understand what he was saying. Okay. So anyway, at a certain point, <laughs> uh, uh, I came to the um, conclusion that our field needed an identity uh, that it didn't possess, okay? and that the um, uh, historical identity options uh, were not good enough. Okay? Now, when this occurred to me, and so you know, I'm talking about this now loosely, right? Various days it hit me in different ways. Um, uh, so the, 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 Mar the, the Kennedy School thing didn't work because there was no discipline. It was like Harvard Business School. It was a branded practice, okay? And uh, the only way to become a public manager was to go there and do their thing. End of discussion, okay? Uh, and uh, well, it completely failed as a project at the Kennedy School and didn't populate bar broadly the rest of the field at all. And so public management just uh, decided to deal with this by, by you know, sort of shedding any particular identity, uh, which didn't seem to me like a very good option. Uh, the, the Larry Lynn thing was great in the discourse about a field and a discipline, and it's not this, and it's got to embrace that and turn away from this and create this new label profession, but it wasn't actually about public uh, organizations specifically, it was some very general point about public administration. Uh, and then the Bardak stuff, which was fantastic and teachable and uh, got into my research all the way back in the Air Force book, nobody could understand it at all, okay? And the same problem, it's not tied to a discipline and there was no forensic history attached to it, okay? Um, so then I said, okay, well, let's, we need a discipline idea. Let's go back to Herbert Simon's discipline idea. Well, they, you know, it was great, except nobody, every time I use the words Simon, design, everybody said, oh, you're talking about design science, okay? In a way, which was what Simon was against. <laughs> design science was the medical model, basically, okay? I mean, he had a very specific idea of design science in chapter five, but that's not what people bomb on to. So you go, oh my God, you know, what are we gonna do here? Uh, uh, I, I better combine forces with some existing you know, orientation with a label and, and tradition that uh, uh, because I can't do Simon for that. And, and uh, so what am I gonna do? Well, I gotta go to a mainstream. I'll go to Harvard. I know that stuff and I kind of like it except for its limitations. So let's transcend. I only found the word transcend when I read Burke you know, a few months ago. Let's transcend this dualism between uh, uh, Simon uh, and the Harvard thing and create something good, something good enough to fight the medical model, okay, which is the thing that licenses the uh, colonization of management by social science, okay, which is our big problem. Okay? So a uh, little misunderstanding in, uh, in Bert George's uh, review of the book in that he sort of says, I came up with a um, um, uh, uh, intellectual foundations, the intellectual foundations of the field of public management. Well, bullshit. There is no field of public management to have intellectual foundations for. Okay? That constitution metaphor came from that. Okay? Okay? You got to distinguish between the constitution and the theoretical foundations of research or whatever it is you're doing uh, to perform the office of discovering curate. Yeah? So got to have two things and they feed on each other. If you don't have a constitution, you can't do the right kind of research, okay? No two ways about it. And if the research is gonna feed into uh, teaching and not just be a separate kind of thing, you have to have a constitutional idea with that principle involved and you need to talk about its historical predecessors, right? Which is where Simon is most forceful. Okay, because Simon says you can't, knowledge is important, um, no less important than uh, skillful performance, in particular skillful performance in designing and all the other things Simon also did well.
Okay? But knowledge is something to be used, not applied. Okay? It's something that you have there sitting in your agency that you have to exercise when you do your agency act ratio. Okay? Nobody has to know about it necessarily. They may want to see, they, you may have to put it on display, but that's another question. That idea of agency act ratio, having knowledge in the agency, but knowledge is not part of the Harvard thing. Damn it. <laughs> Simon got it right. You actually have to furnish people with some knowledge, domain and design, so that they can be a competent professional practitioner. Uh, but we don't want to go so far as to say that is that knowledge is technological rules in a variety of domains. And the only uh, role for the, uh, the only thing the agents have to do is know it well enough to apply it to the particular situation, give a, 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 a deliver a charming uh, practical argument that's principally threaded with technical argument. That's the modern medical model. Not good enough if you're interested in all these unknown questions that uh, Pascal was talking about. So this kind of clarity on the essentials is really important to have an idea of a discipline of public management. And I think it, you know, we could clean up the uh, strategy field a little bit with this kind of stuff too. Okay. So that's the, um, that's, the, uh, that's the kind of idea. Now, um, um, so what I was, the, and this goes to maybe, you know, I'll pick up some comments so on Xavier's point. Yes, I'm glad you like the constitution idea. To me, it's more like a constitution about the relations between the constitution in terms of functions that we have to perform in the academy and some very clear orientations about their interdependencies and some ideas about the actual reality uh, to bring it about, although most of the ideas about actual reality to bring it about can be a technical discussion. Okay. So if you look at the table at the end of my uh, chapter one, that's my picture of the Constitution. Um, uh, so uh, Design, focus, design oriented professional discipline. Uh, whether you want to use these words or not, and I'll come back to the, uh, the, the um, Nuno's point after this. Um, that's one expression. You can't break it into pieces, right? It's as much tied together as the pentad. You, know? <laughs> you can't take anything out and have the same thing. Um, uh, and that is that um, uh, if you say professional discipline all by itself, if you say profession, on its own. That suggests some licensed group of people that has the authority of the state behind it and so on and so forth, like in law. It's not, management isn't one of those things. Okay? Uh, neither is it like medicine in the same, for the same reason. So it's not a profession. Okay? We can be a professional discipline without being a profession. Okay? Who said that? Simon. <laughs> but um, uh, he said it kind of awkwardly in Science of the Artificial because he has one paragraph in talking about uh, professional schools and another paragraph talking about Science of the Artificial and he never actually, and, and this is on the long list of unfinished business, Pasco, <laughs> he never actually put the two together as a term, right? Uh, a form, an archetype of a professional discipline that is different from the archetype of professional disciplines that is best modeled by law and, and medicine. So I came up with a term, design-oriented professional discipline. Now, um, uh, you can shorten it once people understand the idea, right? Um, now, do you want to call it that? Well, this gets back to the you know, art of communicating. Yeah? Well, it depends on your act scene ratio. It depends on who you want to be. It depends on your agent scene ratio. It's there in agency, okay? Because it's there in history. Uh, I pulled it out of history by doing something in the scene agency ratio, okay? Do it if you want, but it has to fit who you are, what your intent is, your tangle of motive, your, your scene. And, but if you're gonna do it, you better have to, you have to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Uh, otherwise, it's not going to uh, have any effect on the scene purpose ratio, okay? Um, so to speak, not gonna move anything. Um, so, I think in public administration, I, I have a story to tell about that, right? Well, there's a lot of, it's a big field, okay? No question, interdisciplinary fields, interdisciplinary in both senses, social sciences, different professions, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so um, public management is one of many disciplines, academic disciplines in, in the academy of public administration, yeah? 
Well, this is just one. Okay, it's got some properties that are in common with other disciplines. We're not just different in every way, but we're different in some ways. Okay, we're common with some others in that we take the public administration to have present within it uh, enterprises, which we can talk about archetypally. So the program planning and, and evaluation people do that. Uh, we do that. What's the difference? Their enterprise archetype is a program, our enterprise archetype is a public organization. Okay, next question. What does ours have to do with theirs? I got to come up with something to fill that little rhetorical need. Uh, there I go to Mark Moore. Mark Moore says the public organizations are furnishing the programs with the capabilities to innovate and deliver, in particular deliver. And uh, that's fine with me. I think we can work with that because we have a lot of ideas in management about how to furnish capabilities. And we just adjust that to understand that capabilities include authority uh, as, in, as is an argument. And so we're really interested in how public organizations uh, satisfy the twin imperatives of support and capacity as they operate in a larger ecosystem that includes the programs that they provide capabilities for. Anyway, it's a little bit of a rhetoric of public administration that has its own roots in the field. And I, but you're not, but the, the rhetorical scene is completely different in, in management. Yes, this has a lot of implications for teaching. My teaching has been reflecting this for years and years, and as Nuno knows. Uh, and uh, this is more the theory that has come in behind it. In that sense, it's a little bit like what Simon did. He was teaching, designing in, in his way, and then wrote the book about what it was uh, he was doing. Okay. Uh, I can give you, very happy to share any teaching materials uh, I have in that regard. Um, on uh, schools of public administration, I've been working with a, a Brazilian, uh, Escola Nacional de Administração Pública, that in Portuguese for Nuno, and so, um, for five years and a lot of this has come out of our interactions and now you know i taught a whole course about how to do design focused case studies last week with them and we agreed uh, we have 50 40 participants and we now have a new prospective society for design oriented public management uh, research uh, i've got it all worked out oh, but only in pen tags so i can share my pen tags on the on the society but there's a whole research aspect of this that's not the constitution that's the theoretical foundations. And what we need to do is furnish professional knowledge, okay, about uh, public organizations and their management. Furnish professional knowledge about public organizations and their management. That becomes agency for the professional practitioner. And they can, but they have to use it in the way that suits their volitions, their motives, their scene. And that requires them to understand these ideas better than anybody else because they're gonna to have to explain the ideas in the language of the scene, not in the language of the classroom. And that's the biggest challenge for mastering the art of communication. As you can see, I could go on for a longer time, but I do notice it's five minutes over, so I'll stop. Yes, I, I guess uh, we would have needed a, a three hour session maybe to include also the, the feedbacks and the uh the tremendous and very interesting amount of discussions this uh, these ideas uh, bring together with them so but i think uh, <clears throat> i mean uh, i think you, you sh still can use this room huh? if i mean if uh, anybody wants to uh you know interact uh, a little bit more uh so wh what do you say michael if you have I mean, 10 more minutes, I think we can leave the, the room open. I'm not going anywhere and it's an hour earlier for me, so. Yeah, I, I, that's what I do. I will, I will uh, make you uh, the host, right? So if you want to uh, take the opportunity to, yeah, that's it. But anyway, I think we can, uh, you know, formally close the symposium now because also I think uh, these have been a very, very intense days for, for everyone, but uh, I, I'm really happy about the turnout of this uh, in terms of the exchange of ideas. I have uh, a lot of ideas actually that uh, I, I could talk about, about this with the Italian National School of Public Administration on, on my hand. Uh, but I, yeah, I think the main goal uh, has probably been accomplished in, in the sense of the enrichment of each disciplinary, uh, you know, 
backgrounds. Uh, I think we, we are all enriched by each other's ideas and I think we definitely should do this more often. What do you think? So thanks, uh, Michael, first of all. Uh, I highly recommend, uh, of course, the book. You find the, the open access link in the, in the chat. Uh, we will make the recording available for this, so probably expect more people to you know, reach out to you. And I thank, uh, uh, of course, Javier and Pascal for co-hosting this with me and for their interesting discussion. And especially I thank all the people that reacted and uh, all our participants who provided uh, uh, and they reach the, this, this discussion with their comments and their, and their ideas. So enjoy your uh, uh, continuation of URAM. And uh, yeah, I hope there will be further occasions to have this kind of interaction, cross-sig interaction. Yeah, Thanks. thank you very thank you. much, Andrea. This is a, was an excellent initiative, really. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thank you. I think, yeah, the, the, the props go to Javier actually, because it was, he was the, the actual, you know, facilitator for this. But anyway, it was a pleasure to do so. And uh, thanks, Michael. I hope to talk to you very, very soon. Look forward to it. Thank you, everybody. I can stay a half hour or whatever it is anybody wants to, to do. If, uh, the, if the recording doesn't go or if the means of communication doesn't terminate. Um, but thank you. I don't know if anybody wants to be uh, kind of moderating, hosting. Um, I, I can always use uh, some curtailing of my enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be happy to stay on. I'd be happy to